Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at a mystery vintage instrument here. I've actually already restored it and it looks much better. I'll show you photos of the original version. Now, if you look at my Patreon page, I promise to do more of these weird, unusual things as we hit various goals in the Patreon. So please do take a look at that. It is very helpful, of course, for the channel. So I want you to take a guess and what this could possibly be. It only has this one terminal here. You can see with two prongs on it. And then there's a ground terminal over there, which is connected to the chassis. This is made of metal, really quite heavy. And of course, the star is the glass tube thing in the center of it. And there's also a rod here on the side. So th what it is actually is written on the other side with a little logo on top of it. But I didn't want to give you a chance to think about what this could possibly be. And if you guessed a capacitive voltage divider, you would be correct. This is an HP model 452A. And its job is really simple. Divide an incoming AC signal by a predictable ratio using capacitive division. I'll talk about the theory of that in just a second. But the idea here is that you have a very high voltage AC signal coming in and you want to divide it down so you can connect it to something that can measure regular low AC signals but at much, much lower value. Now you cannot typically, at least not back then, create capacitors that have very large breakdown using traditional materials. So they were using vacuum tubes. This is from 1950, which is quite amazing. And when I got it, it had really bad paint and it was scratched and damaged and I tried to repaint it and maintain all of its unique features like the front a label and everything else as we will see. And the silver paint was really important because that was the only paint that I had. Now in the center here, this vacuum tube is a capacitor and this capacitor is kept within a vacuum environment to increase the dielectric breakdown of the two parallel plates significantly, giving this capacitor in the middle very, very high voltage breakdown. But nonetheless, there is this rod over here with a certain calculated distance here. And this distance is designed such that the breakdown of this gap is 25,000 volts in atmosphere air, of course. So if you put more than 25,000 volts across it, an arc will appear here and supposedly discharge whatever it is you're measuring. It's a safety measure, of course. And then inside of it, there's additional capacitors to so divide it down. Those capacitors do not have to be such a high a breakdown voltage because this guy is what's handling it. So it's designed and engineered for that purpose. Of course, grounding it is very important and so on. And we'll take a look at inside of it and we'll take a look at its uh, manual, which is nicely available so we can see what they were thinking about and how they wrote about making these really high voltage measurements. And then, of course, we'll test it out. So and here's the manual here, written in 1950. So let's take a look and see what it talks about. And the language of the manual is the language of the 1950s. And some of the terminology is slightly different, but it makes sense. So first of all, it's working from 25 cycles per second to 20 megacycles per second. That's just basically saying 25 hertz to 20 megahertz. Now, a capacitive voltage divider should work in theory across every frequency range, but because of the limitation and the parasitics these devices have, there is a limited frequency range that they will operate. It also says that it uses two different capacitors. One capacitor is 15 micromicrofarad. That's just saying 15 picofarad, 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the minus 6. And that's the primary capacitor. That's that vacuum tube capacitor you see in the front end. It's only 15 picofarad. The plates are fairly far apart from each other. And then there is a capacitor on the inside that totals 15,000 picofarad, so a thousand times larger. And a division between those two will give you a ratio of 1 to 1,000 which is the division ratio of this capacitive voltage divider. And it goes in a little bit further into the safety and how to use it, but we should be able to find all of these capacitors. So let's go further down over here. You can see the maximum voltages that you're allowed to apply to it, depending on the frequency coming in. And that's because of the impedances, of course, because the impedance of the capacitances are a function of frequency. Now, one very nice thing about dividing using a capacitive division is that the input capacitance or the input the impedance of the system can be kept extremely low. In this particular case, we only have a 15 picofarad capacitance on the high voltage input. So you can measure uh, AC signals from a very, very high impedance source and still get a good division ratio, which I like very much. Now, going further down, we should see a schematic here. There's our schematic and it shows all the necessary components to make this work. So here's our high voltage input terminal. That's at the very top of the vacuum tube. Here's our vacuum tube equivalent capacitance, 15 micro microfarad, and that is the only part of the circuit that has to run at very high voltages. The rest are already divided down. And it looks like that the big capacitor inside of the unit is made up three different capacitances. And the capacitance C4 is adjusted in factory so that you get the 1,000 to 1 ratio you're looking for. Because there are variations of these capacitances, they're not perfect. The vacuum tube capacitor may also not be perfect. And in order to get a certain percentage of precision accuracy and so on, you will need to adjust the value of C4. And I think that's what it says over here. 
Now the grounding of this is really important because if you don't ground it, the entire thing can shift up in potential and can be quite dangerous. Now there's also this component here. This could be a protection against uh, very, very high voltages appearing here, but that's not the spark gap because the spark gap would have to be here so that the voltages between it and the high voltage input, this should be grounded here, so the voltages between these two nodes cannot exceed 25,000 volts RMS, otherwise an arc will form. So this must be an additional protection somewhere else, and then this goes into a low voltage AC voltmeter, so we can measure what the actual division is. Now the, the way frequency division, or voltage division I should say, between capacitors work is exactly the same as resistors, and because the capacitances all have frequency dependence, but they appear on both sides of the division, they cancel each other out. So in theory, you should be able to use capacitive divisions across any frequency, but that's not the case because there are parasitics and other capacitances hanging from different nodes, for example, and that can affect the division and it can have give you a frequency dependence and these capacitors will go outside of their soft resonance and many other things can happen. But unlike resistive divider, the capacitive division is lossless. So you can have very, very high input impedance. The input impedance of this entire structure is defined by capacitor C1. Makes things very easy, very, very a nice low capacitor, so you can measure uh, high impedance sources. And transformers, as I described, have their own challenges. So it's very nice and simple, but can be quite handy if you need to measure thousands of volts and have no other way of getting that signal safety into a test and measurement equipment. So now that we understand how it works, let's take a look inside of it and do some experiments with it. And here is what's inside of the instrument from the bottle. I've taken the bottom off essentially and we can see the three capacitors. And it's kind of neat. Look, there's a little Allen key at the bottom. This is the Allen key used to remove the tube already included inside the unit. Pretty awesome. So these three microcapacitors are all in parallel. And that's exactly what the service manual shows as well. The one of the terminals is tapped out. That's what goes on to the cable that we can measure from the outside. But because everything is connected to the chassis, everything is in parallel, and the high voltage vacuum capacitor terminal is right over there. And we can screw in the vacuum tube so it doesn't fall out. Yeah, so the design is, of course, very, very simple. These capacitors are all original. We can measure them to make sure that they're still working. But I really like it. It's a simple and effective solution. And from the top, the terminal where the vacuum capacitor goes in is also visible, as we saw from the bottom, connects to the capacitors, and that's how the connection is made. And there's a hole that goes from the left side through, and there's a tiny hole over there where you can tighten it so that the tube doesn't fall out. I think it's just so much attention to detail for such a simple thing. And here is our vacuum capacitor. Looks very nice, and there are the two plates on the inside, separated by vacuum, of course. And when you separate things by vacuum, the breakdown of the capacitor increases dramatically, as there is nothing to ionize, or at least very little things to ionize. There's the port where the vacuum has been applied and then sealed, of course. This is the instrument side, and that's the user side. And the tip looks like a high-voltage Tesla coil tip. That's, of course, what you want. Don't want any sharp edges on it, so you don't get any chrono discharge, and you don't get any sparks formation. But yeah, look at that. It is beautiful. So we can go ahead and put this back on the unit, of course, and see if we can get any meaningful measurements out of it. So let's use our LCR meter and see if we can measure roughly the capacitance as we expect, both from the microcapacitors on the inside, as well as the capacitance of the vacuum tube itself, as it is sitting inside of this, taking it in everything into account. So I've connected the two terminals over there to my LCR meter, the key site E4980A, and we can take a look at the capacitance. And here's the value of the capacitor, 14.2 nanofarad at 10 kilohertz with a, about a 1 ohm of series resistance. Remember, this is after 70 years that these microcapacitors are measuring very close to their theoretical 15 nanofarad value. And then we're going to measure the capacitance of the tube as well. And together, they should have hopefully a ratio of about 1,000 to 1. And here is the capacitance of the tube itself, 16.7 picofarad. This is a very difficult measurement to make and to calibrate because of the stray capacitances that will appear at the top of the measurement instrument itself. And the resistance, as you can see, is very hard to measure. But the values are very close to where they're supposed to be. So I'm confident that we should be able to get the 1,000 to 1 ratio fairly well with an AC signal. And let's try that. So in order to test this capacitive voltage divider, we need a high voltage AC source. So for that, I'm going to use the Associated Research Incorporated ACDC Withstand Voltage Tester. This is model 3665, and this is going to be a subject of a different video. I've done a repair on this. It hasn't been released yet. But essentially what this allows you to do is to apply voltages up to about 5 kilovolts, both at AC and DC, to check for leakages and, and see if things can have sufficient dielectric breakdown. So we're limited to 5 kilovolt AC here, but this is going to be good enough. The fluke here is set to voltage AC measurement, directly connected over here. So everything is grounded using the ground here on the left side, 
and the probe is just simply sitting on top of this and I've switched to a plastic pointing tool in this case. So if I turn this on test voltage here, we're going to get one kilovolt AC applied to the top of our capacitive divider. We expect to see one volt here. Let's see what we get. Running the test here. Check it out. 0.98. That's pretty good. It's almost a thousand to one. I haven't checked the accuracy of this yet. It may be that that's a little bit off, but that's a very good 1000 to one ratio. It's pretty close. So I think things are working. Let's go ahead and change it to a higher voltage. And here we are at five kilovolts. Let's go and turn this on now. And what do we get? 4.91. Not bad. There may be some noise pickup from the microphone because this is not well insulated. Remember that there's going to be some losses in that cable. Just we're losing electrons in the air no matter how much we try. So there will be a lower value division in this very, very high voltages, but I think it works very well, and I think the restoration certainly uh, looks good now, so I'm happy to add this to the lab as a you know, weird instrument. So it's not certainly not something that you'd be using all the time, but I still think it's a pretty cool combination of instruments to test it out. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks again to all the Patreon supporters. Uh, please do check out the page if this is something you like to participate in. I actually only charge a fraction of the videos to the Patreon page. Most of the videos are just released normally, and I do that to reduce the cost to the Patreon supporters. In fact, I don't think I even charge one for the past one or two months. I just posted them on YouTube regularly. As always, I'm very grateful for those of you who are supporting the channel. I'll see you next time.